<laughs> I'm getting some nods. <laughs> Praise the Lord. A while back, as I mentioned to you last week, the Lord spoke to me about this area of fear. And fear is something that uh, we're getting a lot of responses on as far as just that people are dealing with this issue. Um, there's all kinds of different fears that come about in our lives, you know. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about one of those. But we all understand that it's something that we deal with. And the Word of God speaks of a healthy fear. Uh, we are called in the Scriptures to fear God, aren't we? Um, but that's a, that's a healthy fear. And really what we're focusing on is the unhealthy side of fear. Because when we fear God, which we're all called to do... We want to have a reverence, you know, for the Lord. Really, the Word of God in a healthy fear, we understand, it, it, is that it's speaking louder than, than the rest of the voices in our lives. And, and that's a healthy fear of God. Um, as we've discovered last week, and I want to encourage you, two weeks ago, Nikki uh, uh, kind of launched us into this uh, area of, of fear, and uh, she shared her phobia of bumblebees, and uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I know, I give you a hard time about that, so I think one Sunday we all just need to like come in dressed up like bumblebees or something, you know, <laughs> <So> <laughs> because she's so sweet, that's right, that's right, so anyway, uh, last week, uh, I want to encourage you again, listen to the messages, dissect them, let the Spirit of God speak to you. And uh, fear is a spirit, okay? And that's one of the things that we focused on last week. It's not a spirit of God. It's a demonic spirit. It's a false spirit. And uh, within that message last week, I talked about the, the, it's really a demonic spirit of prophecy. It, it's, it's the spirit that comes and wants to prophesy. Look into the, the demonic crystal ball and, and, and put fear inside of you and prophesy the end. It, remember, we talked about how our prodigals, you know, well, they're too far gone. You know, truth says that he's married to the prodigal. That's what the Word of God says. But, but fear comes and whispers in your ear, they're too far gone. They're too far into drugs. They can't be set free. They're too far into to bondage. Those are all things that the spirit of fear will do. That's just one example, and I encourage you to listen to that. The other thing that we, we recognize is that fear, that spirit of fear is looking for a place to occupy. Okay, It's looking for a vacancy. It's looking for an open door. It's looking for a window in your life to come in. And I will tell you this, just in my own life, and I know talking with many of you, it doesn't stop, does it? Um, it, it, it continually comes, it, it never ceases to harass you, and it will continue to seek for an inroad into your life somewhere. And I loved what the Holy Spirit gave me on this. Um, fear is nothing more than a lying fortune teller attempting to destroy the work of God in you and keep you from growing and maturing in your faith. I think that's good. Let me read that one more time. Fear is nothing more than a lying fortune teller attempting to destroy the work of God in you and keep you from growing and maturing in your faith. You know, grow, we all have to grow in our faith, don't we? That's something that we need to do. We need to mature. And fear wants to keep you held hostage. It wants you to plant your tent pegs out and to keep you from grow, growing. And unfortunately... It's often successful. That's the disappointing thing. And I think if we're all honest with one another, we've probably been there before where we've succumbed to that voice of fear. But the main thing that I've witnessed is that people who succumb to this influence, they become very isolated and they become unresponsive. In fact, people can even go to them and speak truth to them, but they refuse to even hear it, because everything that is coming to them is coming through this veil or this filter, if you will, of fear. See, the spirit of fear does this. It creates an atmosphere around an individual, okay? And it creates an atmosphere that becomes very self-focused. Everything becomes about my wound. Everything becomes about that thing that I've gone through or the issue or that person that offended me. And we talked about that last week 
a little bit. You know, I do not have a right to be offended. I don't. I do not have a right. Now, I know that's, that's flying in the face of what culture says, but I have no right at the foot of the cross to be offended because Jesus was the only one who ever really truly had a right to be offended. He lived this life perfectly innocent, went to a cross, suffered a criminal's death, now that would offend most people, but it didn't offend Jesus. In fact, it says that he willingly gave his life for you and for me, even when you and I were still in our sin. That's an incredible thought. And if that would get in our hearts, if just that thought would get in our hearts, it might change the way that we approach this thing called Christianity and living this faith out. But the spirit of fear wants to create an atmosphere where we become so focused on our own woundedness and our own hurt and our own issues and our own life trauma that we can't do anything else. I think it's very sad when that happens to an individual. Now, the three areas that we're going to start to focus on, one is the fear of man, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then there's the fear of failure. We'll, we'll deal with that. And then the last one will be the fear of the unknown. Or really, if you think about it, that's the fear of change. Okay? And I know that we all just love change, don't we? Oh, gosh. No, we don't. So today we're going to talk about the fear of man. All right? We are called to fear God. We're, all of us. We're all called to fear God and not man. It's a reverential fear like we just mentioned. It's that, it's that place that says the influence of the Lord and His Word, it must loom larger than any other voice in my life, okay? When I fear God, that's really a healthy fear to have. When He speaks, when I understand what it says in His Word, his, his, the Bible is God's Word, you can trust this. It's not just a book written by man. The Holy Spirit scripted this, put it in the hearts of people, and it was, if you ever look at how this thing was canonized and put together, you will come away saying, thank you, Jesus. What a beautiful, beautiful God that we serve. And He gave us His very heart right here. The answers to life are in this book, you see. But our lives, our life experiences, our upbringings, you know, some of you had good upbringing, some of you had bad upbringing, some of you had two parents at home, some of you had one parent at home, some of you had no parents. Grandma and grandma, thank God, stepped in and they were able to raise you. Some of you have adopted people, some of you are, are, are signing up to even help with that right now that, I, that I'm aware of. But all these different things that we go through in life, all of our experiences, our situations, the things that we walk through, they shape us and they influence how we either fear God or we fear man. Okay? Fear of man manifests in many different ways. Now, these are not all inclusive. So, you know, you, you could probably, well, pastor didn't say this. No, I, I, it's not an all-inclusive list. And I mentioned several ways that fear manifest, la, ma, manifested last week. One of them with a fear of man, these are different ways, codependent behavior. It's that thing inside of you, you're so desperate on the inside and empty on the inside that you become a people pleaser, okay? And you create situations where you can be the hero. That's codependent behavior. It's almost like I have a need to be needed, all right? Now, I'm not talking about, and I mean, if there's a sense we all want to feel appreciated, but ultimately, where does that come from? God, you see? If I understand who I am in Christ, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it makes all the difference in the world. Lack of trust. Somebody did me wrong, so I say something to myself like, I will never trust them again, okay? And lack of trust is something that just has infected so many uh, different people. But everything gets filtered through the hurt then. Control is another one. This is one that I kind of really wrestled with because I was hurt very badly by past relationships before I got married. So it was very natural for me 
to uh, control, want to control the situation. If I can control it, I can't be hurt by it. Well, that's just a lie from the devil because when you try to control a situation or somebody, okay, you become dominant and everything else, and that just is a disaster for a relationship. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Or if I really live like I know Jesus wants me to live, or lead the way Jesus wants me to lead, I'll be rejected, okay? Well, friends, that's all. these are all things that just feed into the, It's part of the fear of man. And if you have those going on in your life, it's a real good indication that you're operating under this spirit. It's a spirit of fear, but this specifically is a fear of man. Fear of man is something that we all battle. However, it doesn't have to control our lives. Amen? We do not have to be controlled by this spirit at all. In fact, uh, something very differently can take place. What happens to me when I fear man? What happens to me when I fear man more than I actually fear God? Well, there was this cat in the Old Testament. In fact, he was a king. And his name was Saul, all right? And you can find this story in 1 Samuel 13. I'm just going to give you some summary highlights, okay? But Saul was the king of Israel. And the Lord had given Saul specific instructions regarding the Amalekites, okay? Now, the Amalekites were a very wicked, wicked people. They were incredibly corrupt. And the extent of the Amalekites' wickedness, their cruelty, okay, and continued rebellion against God, it was so great that the Lord gave instruction to Saul to wipe out that bloodline completely, 100%, including everything that had to do with them, okay? And that was, you know, you know every age group in, in, included in that. It, me, it meant their, their livestock and everything else that went with it. There was nothing good. The Lord was going to wipe this from the face of the earth. And there was a reason for it because the bloodline was completely corrupted. So when it came down to it, though, Saul, as king, and Saul, like many of us do, he took matters into his own hands. And he did not completely follow the Lord's instructions. Yes, he did attack the Amalekites. And he destroyed everything that he deemed was despised and weak. But he was unwilling to obey the voice of the Lord completely. In fact, here's what he did. He spared the Amalekite king, which was Agag. Agag the king, and he also spared the best sheep, the best cattle and the best lambs. Everything else that he, everything that he deemed to be good, okay, and, and, and able to sacrifice, okay, he had this great plan. But see, that wasn't the word of the Lord, was it? See, God was not pleased with him when this happened. God was actually very upset, and what he ended up doing was he raised up, and in the Old Testament, you'll see how when God would speak, he would often use one of the prophets. Remember, David was the king, and when David fell into sin, Nathan the prophet went to David. God spoke to Nathan, and Nathan went to the king, and he confronted him, okay? And this is the same situation here. God spoke then to Samuel. Now, Samuel has to go and confront Saul. So if you want to turn to 1 Samuel. Thank you, Jesus. You guys still here? Amen. All right. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read verses 12 through 24. What chapter? chapter 15, 1 Samuel 15. I'm reading out of the NIV. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he, was told, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you, and I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Talk about a guilty conscience, right? That's the very first thing he says. But Samuel said, well, what is this that I hear? What's the bleeding of sheep that I hear in my ears? Man, that's really bad. That's, that was a pathetic sheep. Okay, I don't even know if that's right. 
So at least I didn't do the... <laughs> that would be a horse. Okay. All right. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle? I can usually do a pretty good cattle, but I'm not going to do that for you here today. Saul answered, verse 15, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Verse 16, Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and He sent you on a mission saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Okay? See, friends, when we take things into our own hands and we don't obey God, it's evil in the sight of the Lord. And I think we forget that. Verse 20, but I did obey the Lord. See, isn't it amazing how he was deceived? He was deceived in actually believing that he carried out the instructions of the Lord. And here comes the prophet. Bringing the Word of God. And I will tell you, there's a whole message right there. The Word of God will bring you back in line. Thank you, Lord. But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission of the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agog, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is, is the sin of divination or witchcraft, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has rejected you as king. In verse 24, how sad. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions because I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Fear of man. Fear of man. Here's Saul, the great king of Israel, thinking that he's doing this great and wonderful thing, but he didn't carry out the instruction of the Lord, and it cost him the kingdom. See, Saul gave in to the voice of the people. He placed his own conception of what was right and what was wrong above God's Word. Let that sink in. Saul placed his own conception of what was right and what was wrong above, higher than the Word of God. And by the way, this sin, this sin will be the focal point of the final apostasy before Christ's return. In the last days, we know what the Scriptures say, right? The last days, it says people will do what is right in their own eyes. If we're not living in a day and age where people do what is right in their own eyes, for crying out loud, we could grocery list this in here. I could give you example after example. But you know people are doing what is right in their own eyes. They're taking this and they're trying to diminish this book as just a book and not God's Word. Friend, this is God's Word. This is His standard. This is His holy... This is His heart right here. You can bank on this. It's not just for one... Sta one uh, 2,000 years ago, it's for now. It's for today. It's His Word. And His Word stands what? Forever. Can we all say that together? Forever. Alright. But in the last days, people will do what is right in their own eyes. They will set up for themselves ministers and voices that will what? Tickle their ears and accommodate their own conceptions of what is right. People will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 
Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Oh, Lord, help us. I don't ever want to fall into that place where I become a lover of pleasure of this world rather than a lover of God. They will praise me with their lips, but their hearts will be far from me. And friends, one of the main drivers in this is this fear of man. What are they going to say about me if I really get radical and serve Jesus? What are my friends going to say if I actually don't go along and smoke pot with them? Or I don't go along and have sex like everybody else is doing? Or if I actually say that I'm going to wait until I'm married and I'm going to stay pure? Or I'm not going to go with my buddies and look at pornography or whatever it may be? It's the fear of man. And the fear of man is what? It's a snare. And it entraps you just like it did Saul. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. And here's what happened. The prophet, God's voice came. And the prophet called out and Saul was exposed. And even today, there is a prophetic voice that is rising up and it's calling people back to obedience in response to the incredible outpouring of God's beautiful love that's happening all over the world. Our response to God's love being poured out shouldn't be a license to sin. It should be a, a freedom to live a life free from sin. His love empowers us, you see. His love gives us the ability to actually stand in the face of trial and temptation and all the things that bombard us every single week. And we can say no to those things and say yes to Jesus. Amen? The Bible says if God is for us, then who can be against us? David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I be afraid? You see, it's time for God's people. I want to say this to you. Please, hear my heart here. But it's time for us as sons and daughters of God to quit listening to the voice of culture. It's time for the young people to rise up. It's time for the voice of of the Lord to begin to influence culture again, rather than culture coming in and influencing the church. We must allow the voice of the Lord to be the primary voice in our lives. When we don't, we will fall prey to the snare of the enemy. We will have self-made ideas of what is right, And what is wrong? And we will end up becoming just like Saul, giving in to the pressure of culture. See, even in the end, Saul did admit his sin. But it cost him dearly, didn't it? So what causes us to fear man? Well, there's two main areas. The first one that we're probably more familiar with is a life trauma. And and it's all traumatic. But it could be a past wound. It could be a hurt. It could be a difficulty. Um, These all shape how we filter life, okay? Example, if you're young, okay, and you get stung by a bumblebee or something happens, all of a sudden you could grow up if that's not dealt with and you could be like Nikki and you can't even go outside anymore because the whole place is just filled with bumblebees and you can't... I'm just teasing. (laughs) Or how about a dog? Some of you have phobias of dogs. And it could have happened when you were really young. I know some people who were, who, who were like attacked by a dog or bitten by a dog when they were very young and to this day, even when they, in their older age, they're afraid of dogs. I'm going to tell you, I got, I got a dog. His name is Max. I should have put a picture of him up there. But little Max, man, you'll hear him bark. And I've seen people think that, oh my gosh. And he'll even come up to the door and push on the door. But he is, he is the most, he's the nicest dog ever. Now, there's only one dog that I'm going to warn you about, and that's Big Boy. (laughs) Jimmy can tell you all about him. (laughs) Bruce, I think, can tell you all about him, because Bruce, he tore into Bruce. But those things can shape us. How about a bully on the playground? Or a young person who tries to step out, and they get made fun of on social media. Uh, or, Or somebody that puts something out there, and everybody else is getting likes, and you don't get any likes. You see, 
All of these things can cause trauma and they can, they can make you say, I don't trust anybody. Or, or abuse by a trusted person in your life. A leader, a parent, somebody did something very bad and traumatic to you. You can actually come to the place where you say, I will never trust anybody again. And it doesn't even have to be your offense. You can carry the offense of somebody else. Somebody else could have been wounded or hurt, whether it be by a, a, a job or a boss or an institution like a church, you know. And you could carry that grudge for, for them even after they've passed. I've seen that happen. Had that happen in my own family. The second way is this. Neglect. Neglect is a big one. And I'm talking about those kids that never experience love. They never experience a hug. They're always criticized. And this happens a lot. People think that they're doing the right thing. I can remember the one time I've shared this with you before and again. This is no uh, reflection upon it, my, my parents or anything like that. But there was one time I remember as a sophomore in high school, I brought home a report card. And we had eight classes and I had seven A's and one B. You know what I heard about? The B. And those were types of things that, that started to shape me. Those things had had an influence on me. And I remember that, not a, again, not, a, not as a, an issue that I have with them. I, we, we made up. It was great. It was just awesome. Jesus just really, you know. It wasn't, it, it wasn't that big of a deal. But it was, here's the thing. Those things can have a traumatic effect in people's lives because what happens when you're neglected or you're criticized all the time or you're always told that this is wrong or that's wrong or you don't do this right or they try to point out that you actually have weeds out in the parking lot that you didn't, Get <laughs> no. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the truth of that. You grow up with a performance mentality. You're constantly looking for affirmation. You can become codependent. So, of course, you're attracted to people that are very needy, and then you're going to go in and fix them, and you can be the hero, and you can be the one that's going to take care of these problems. No. See, these are two ways the fear of man primarily get in. Through trauma, through neglect, through, through insecurities, and all these things. And we, we, we grow up, and, and here's what happens in this second one. They grow up, and even as leaders, they become politicians or people pleasers rather than God pleasers. You can always see when somebody has the fear of man. And that's just like Saul had in his own life. He was a people pleaser rather than a God pleaser. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen just to a point. But he didn't follow the instruction of the Lord all the way. I'm going to be bringing her in for a landing here, okay? Oh, they obey to a certain point. But there's a spirit of fear that continues to grip them. Because the voice of fear is speaking louder than the voice of the Lord. I wish sometimes we had a volume control on the Bible. Wouldn't it be neat if we could turn up the volume... So that the voice of the Lord could be greater. But you know, I don't think that's the answer. I think sometimes what we need to do is we need to turn off some of the other voices. What are you letting influence you, friend? What's your primary voice in your life? Is it the voice of the Lord? Or is it the voice of a past person who hurt you or wounded you? Or is it the voice that says, I can never do anything right? Because all I was is criticized growing up, you see. Or am I listening to the voice of the culture that says, oh, you don't, that, that's just a book. I'm going to tell you right now, friends, you need to pray. For this generation. You need to pray. What ends up happening. When we give in to the voice of man. And the fear of man. Is we become chameleons. We change our colors. Based upon the environment. 
that we're in. On and on and on it goes. Where it ends, nobody knows. The bottom line is this, the fear of man is a snare. It's slavery. And it will cause you to forfeit the kingdom that God had for you. And I say that in the sense of His calling on your life. What a miserable place to be. To be called of God. To know that you were created for a purpose. Only to be disqualified because of your fear of man. How sad it was for Saul to finally come to the realization that he had sinned against the Lord, but yet it cost him the kingdom. It cost him everything. I don't know about you, but I am not willing to let that happen in my life. But the only way that I can even see that remotely not happening is if I surrender and bow my knee to Jesus. It's not going to be just my own will and my own strength. It's not going to be just in my own striving and trying. It's going to be when I finally come to the end of myself and I say, Jesus, I am messed up, but you have everything that I am. I give you my heart. I give you my life. I give you everything, Lord. And if you want to take this old knucklehead, Lord, and use me to preach the gospel, I'll preach your gospel. If you want me to sing praise songs, I'll sing praise songs. If you want me to sit down, I'll sit down. If you want me to train somebody up, I'll train somebody up. If you want me to mow the lawn for God's glory, I'll mow the lawn for God's glory. You want me to clean toilets, I'll clean toilets for your glory. When we are surrendered, we're free from the fear of man. How sad it was to come to that realization. But can I say this? There's always hope. There's always a remedy. And it's what we just talked about. It's in bowing our knees to Jesus. Romans 8.15 says this, You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship. And by Him, we cry, Abba, Father. Now listen, friends. <laughs> you want to be free from the fear of man? You have to embrace the understanding that you are a son and you are a daughter of the King. You are His. And you can try, and you need to try, but I'm going to tell you, you're not going to be loved by Him any more than that first day you bowed your knee to Him and you said, take me as I am. You don't earn points with God. You make more room for anointing to flow in your life and through your life, but you're not earning points with God. He's not going to love you any more than He loves you right now. As messed up and crazy as we can be. We can be crazy. <laughs> you guys are just looking at me like, <laughs> we can be crazy. We can be nuts. We can say all kinds of just unbelievable things we can do all kinds of things <laughs> but his love for you is not going to change <sighs> now we can be like Saul and we can serve him halfway our man why don't we follow his example it says in Philippians chapter 2 that he became nothing and he took on the very nature of a servant. And he became obedient to death. And even the worst kind of death, the criminal's death of the cross. Why? So he could be great? No. He descended into greatness so that you and I could live. Isn't that good news? 
Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, one of the things that I want to just address here real quick, and we have a few minutes left. There's a few things. You have to embrace your identity in Christ. You have to come to terms with the fact that you're His son and you're His daughter. And when you do, it'll change your life forever. You'll quit performing for men, and you'll realize that you have an audience of one. Now, if I were to bring Luke up here, I'd show you his arm. He's got that tattooed on his arm. I love it. It says audience of one. And at first, I'm the dad, you know, the, well, why do you got to get a tattoo? Or da, 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 you know, and all that stuff. But then I realized, no, he was trying to honor something that I'd been telling him his whole life. Yeah. And he put his drumsticks on there. And again, I'm not trying to embarrass you, son, okay? But he put those drumsticks on there. And he put that on there because he never wanted to step behind that kit and start playing without remembering that he has an audience of one. See, this worship team up here is not worshiping for you. It's worshiping for their audience of one. I've told everyone, Janet, you know I've told you that, Lexi, I've told you that, Rodney, Melissa, all of you, I've told you we have an audience of one. We're not performing up here. We are worshiping Jesus. You need to come to terms that you have an audience of one. And the last thing I want to address is this, because one of the dangers when you go through trauma in your life, and this really kind of is a specific thing that I felt the Lord prompt me to say today. Sometimes we make these things called internal vows. Somebody wounds me really bad, okay? Say a pastor wounds me really bad, okay, in my past. And I make a vow and I said, I will never trust another pastor again. It's a seed, it's an inroad, and the spirit of fear. It's just like just taking hold of its hand and putting it right in your heart. I will never trust anybody again. I will never trust him again. I will never trust her again. Friends, those are things that are snares and they're keeping you from experiencing the fullness of God in your life. I realize trauma happens. I have experienced trauma in my life. I realize those things happen, but I do know this. That it will keep you bound. It's like trying to row across a lake... All right, and you're trying to get to the other side, but you still have a rope attached to the dock. You can go so far, but eventually you can row and row and row and row, and you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to go anywhere until you finally get out that big old spiritual machete and you cut that line the way it was designed to be cut, and then you can go to the other side. Now, I don't know about you. But I don't want to row across a lake with ropes attached to the shore. I want to be free. Because when you're free, the Spirit of God can tell you, hey, go over here. Go over here. In fact, I want you to trailer the boat. Let's go to another lake. Let's go over here. Let's go over there. You see what I'm saying? There's freedom when you break and renounce those internal vows that you've made. Forgiveness is not forgetting. But forgiveness is this. Forgiveness is releasing. I've had to do that recently. I've had, I, I had some situations just with a, a past leader in my life recently that I, I realized that I was still, I still had a, a rope tied to the shore. And I finally had to say, God, I just release him to you. I was, I was hurt. I was offended. And in you know, the world's eyes, I was justified. No. I don't go by the world standard when it comes to that. I go by His. And His says, for me to forgive. See, friends, if you don't forgive, the Bible says you can't be forgiven. I know people that have made internal vows and said, I will never forgive them for that. 
If you've said that, friend, that's a very dangerous place to be. I'm saying that as a word of caution because I care and love about you. And I want to see you becoming all that you can be in Christ. I want you to be the woman and the man of God that He has created you to be. Fully, not just halfway across the lake, but the whole way. Amen.